this belief or uh, misconception that we need to get over a loss is very much a 20th century invention or construct. There were a series of events that occurred in the first half of the 20th century, including two horrific world wars, that led people to believe that grief was linear and progressive, and that means that there's an end point. From the Totem Project, this is Full Moon Women, a community and a podcast about the inner lives of women. On today's episode, I speak with Hope Edelman, one of the foremothers of the grief revolution. Hope's work has opened the door for honest conversations about grief and loss. In a world that thinks you should be over your loss already or yesterday, Hope's work makes grief and love and loss normal and welcome. Hope is the author of eight nonfiction books, including the New York Times bestseller, Motherless Daughters, and most recently, The After Grief, Finding Your Way Along the Long Arc of Loss. I'm Jamie Younger, your host, and it is my great pleasure and honor to bring real women's stories to your world, stories that move me and hopefully remind all of us to value our stories, and in some cases, make important decisions in our lives. On Full Moon Women, we publish episodes in couplets. The first episode in each couplet is a woman's story, something personal from her inner life. It's a long-form narrative piece. And the second episode in the couplet is a conversation with someone who can give us greater context and hopefully a greater appreciation for that storytelling woman's story. Our last episode was with Brenda Vandenberg, a woman whose mother died when she was two years old. Brenda's story is about loss, motherhood, longing, and reclaiming. Today, I speak with Hope Edelman. Hope and I discuss the nature of loss and grief, how to keep someone in our hearts after they've died, And what we can do when we run into someone who's lost someone and we just don't know what to say. Hope has been writing, speaking, and leading workshops and retreats in the bereavement field for over 25 years. Hope was 17 when she lost her own mom to breast cancer and 40 when her dad died. Those events inspired her to offer grief education and support to a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't receive it. Hope's first book, Motherless Daughters, was a number one New York Times bestseller and appeared on multiple bestseller lists worldwide. Hope's most recent book, The After Grief, offers an innovative new language for discussing the long arc of loss. Hope hosts regular weekly calls to support motherless daughters. So to begin, Hope, thanks for joining me for this conversation. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. I will just share again that we do our episodes in for this show in couplets. So the first in the couplet is a long form narrative story where we share a woman's story from a woman's life about some aspect of her inner life. And then on the following week, we put out what we call a column episode where we speak with someone who can bring a wider context to that woman's you know, very singular and very personal story. So in this conversation, Hope and I, you you and I will discuss your work and your writing and universal themes found in Brenda's story. Just as a quick note for those listeners who haven't had a moment to listen to Brenda's episode, of course, I encourage you to go back and do so. But this episode will be fully understandable and also valuable if you haven't listened to Brenda's story yet. So Hope, you have listened to Brenda's story. Yes. And I'm wondering if you would share what stood out to you about her story. Well, I've been working with women who've lost mothers at an early age for more than 25 years. And I've written about it as well. So I'm aware of the patterns that exist among women's stories and also how uniquely and radically individual every story is too. So I've never heard a story exactly like Brenda's because that's uniquely her story. But there were several themes that showed up 
that I have heard many times, especially at the motherless daughters retreats that I lead, which are four days of groups of women coming together to share their stories. One was how terribly young she was when her mother died. She was only about two years old, so she was too young to have memories. And that's a very specific category of mother loss. Because when you're that young, you don't understand what death is. You won't develop that awareness until between the ages of five and 12, and it comes slowly and in pieces. So she would have experienced the loss of her mother more as an absence than an actual loss of someone that she could remember, especially when she's looking back because she doesn't have any conscious memories of their time together. Also, her relationship with her stepmother is not an uncommon one, unfortunately, among women who lose mothers young. Her father remarried very quickly a year after her mother died. Also very, very common. And um, her desire to reconnect with her mother and, and get a sense of who she was as a woman later in life, especially when she became a mother herself. That's something I encounter and I work with women to help them do that because it's, it's such a, you know, it's such a, a frequent desire among women who lose their mothers young. Yeah, I was, I was very moved by Brenda's story. And that's, of course, why we wanted to include her story in the show. And one of the reasons I was really intrigued to have you in this conversation is not just because you've done work around this, but that you've also yourself had an experience of losing your mom. Right. Um, In your book, Motherless Daughters, you talk about during your college years, you had this weird urge to walk up to strangers and tell them my mother died when I was 17 um, because you had, I guess, recognized, you know, this was a fact about yourself and you sort of felt alienated. Um, Right. And that it was definitive to who you were. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, how did losing your mom define you? Well, I was 15 when she was diagnosed with breast cancer and 17 when she died. And I hardly knew any other girls other than my sister and one neighbor who had lost a mom that young. So I felt really marginalized. I felt really out of sync with my peers. I had had to face and process and integrate a kind of knowledge that they fortunately would not have to encounter for many years. And it was such a seismic, such a cataclysmic event to go through so young. I felt that it really did define me in so many ways and did for a long time until other definitions came along to be added to that one. But so much of my identity was shaped in those early years after my mother died by that loss that, yes, I did feel that I should let people know that about me right away, you know, as if it was the filter that they should interpret all of my behaviors or thoughts or desires because it felt like it was, in fact, the foundation for all of that moving forward. That actually, I think, also came from an Anna Quinlan column Back in the 1980s, Anna Quinlan, I think, was about 19 when her mother died from ovarian cancer. And and she also said that she often had the impulse to walk up to strangers and say, hi, my name is Anna, and I was 19 when my mother died. And this was something that when I started doing interviews for Motherless Daughters, I heard from many, many women. It felt like such a defining event. They wanted people to know it about them right away. Yeah. I was in doing research for for Brenda's story and preparing to speak with you. I looked at a lot of things on this topic and I saw this Instagram post that I think it was a kind of sticker or pen that you could wear that said, forgive me for behaving strangely. I just lost my person. Um, you know, and I'm just bringing this up because when you say you felt you wanted people to sort of interpret you through the fact that this was a major event that had happened in your life and how you were behaving. I don't know if if that's exactly what you're saying, but that's sort of why you wanted people to know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think I wanted people to know because I felt that it explained or excused some of my behaviors at that age. But I think that pin is a marvelous idea because it tells the polity, you know, or, or the community, treat me a little more gently. I'm more fragile than I normally am. I might need to be handled a little differently. It used to be in the prior century and up until about the 19-teens or 20s that Western culture, particularly Victorian culture, had rituals that made a mourner known in public. 
everything from the wreath that you hung on your front door that said to the anyone walking by, someone who lives here or is related to these people has recently died, to the clothing that individuals wore. And there were very elaborate rules about how you dressed and what kind of social interactions you would have for a prescribed period of time, depending on who had died. The responsibility for this fell mainly on the women. We Women would wear black when they were in what was called high mourning, and then they would shade their colors down to gray and purple, and it could last anywhere from six weeks for a cousin, I believe, all the way up to two years for a spouse or child. And so when they went out in the world, people knew that they were in mourning and could treat them a little differently. Now our mourners are invisible in this culture. So unless we tell people that we have experienced a loss, there would be no way for anyone to know and be able to factor that into their interactions with us. Gosh, that's all really good point. I think many of us have gone to museums where we see these kind of mourning shawls or or headpieces from that era. And I had never put sort of two and two together. It just seemed this sort of antiquated thing. But yes, very much it indicates to the outside world, many people who don't know you while you're just on the street of, hey, be gentler with me if if you don't mind. <laughs> and, you know, there are some cultures that do have signifiers. And I, I want to also acknowledge that what I was just talking about was predominantly Western Protestant culture. Brinda grew up in India. So the rituals around grief and the messages around grief that she received would have been particular to Indian culture at that time that her mother died because grief is also historically relative and there are different belief systems and therefore different cultural messaging that changes over the centuries for sure, but sometimes even over the decades. I was raised in a Jewish family and in Judaism, you wear a black ribbon pinned to your clothing for, I think it's the first 30 days, and please forgive me, anyone who's more observant than me if I'm getting that wrong, but I think it's 30 days. And I was 17 years old, and I remember I I thought I should do this, and I went out in public with this black ribbon on my shirt, and almost immediately a friend's grandmother said, oh my God, honey, what happened? Who died? And then I realized if I wear this black ribbon, I have to tell everybody the story, even to strangers over and over. And I didn't want to do that at 17. I'm not sure I'd want to do that now. So I started wearing it underneath my shirt, like pinning it to my bra. So I felt like I was still honoring my mother. But my father was very secular, but my mother was observant. So I wore it inside my clothing or underneath my clothing so that it was still there, but I didn't have to announce it to the world. Yeah. So that's the other side of it, right? So you're sort of in invisible or too visible, <laughs> either invisible or too visible. It's, you know, you, it's hard to find the middle bowl of porridge. Right. Um. One of the things I admire so much about your work is how you do so much research in your writing. And at one point in an interview I heard you did with Google Talks, you just said, that, you know, I'm a research junkie and, and I... And I <laughs> so true. And, and, and I, I really appreciated that. And I'm wondering, what did the women who you've spoken with over the many years now, what are some of the things that they have in common and maybe even things that are sort of surprising? Well, I'm always struck by the number of women who were not supported in grief as children, who were either silenced overtly by other family members saying, well, don't think about that or talk about that because it will make you upset or don't bring that up because it will upset your father or your grandmother. Um, What lack of support there was for children certainly in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. My mom died in 1981. There was no grief support services for family at that time. They didn't really start developing in the U.S. until the 1990s. And of course, in other countries, sometimes even later, or not at all yet. Now there are many, many, many more resources available to children and families, but they're still not everywhere yet. But I'm struck by how that silencing from the adults around them became internalized so that the women began to self-silence. And when we do retreats, and we're just getting back to in-person retreats, next week, actually, 12 women are coming to the... congratulations. I know. (laughs) You know, this is is like my church, these retreats. It's extraordinary to see the transformation that occurs in women in just two and a half days. They arrive on a Thursday evening. They leave on a Sunday afternoon. And I'm going to go a little off track here, but it is to your point, which is what do I see in common? I see the women show up 
and they're there you when when I when I was doing them before there were 26 women now because of covid we're bringing it down to 12 to 14 for a while but 26 women would sit in a circle and the majority of them would come there with a narrative because we do a lot of work with revisiting revising and reframing your story and they arrive with the narrative i'm all alone i've been alone for a long time nobody understands me i'm i've never known any other woman who lost a mother at the same age or of the same cause or even when she was young and I'm, you know, I've had to manage on my own all these years. And they arrive with that story and they sit in the circle and we go around on the first night. We just do very light introductions. We don't really dive in until Friday morning, but they just hear women saying, hi, I'm Anna and I'm here from Rochester, New York. And I was 13 when my mother died of ovarian cancer. And over and over, you know, they hear women identifying at certain ages and they lost their moms to certain causes and they the women talk about why they're there. And one pattern we see is that women come to the retreats for a couple of reasons. One is because they're feeling stuck at this point in their life because the coping strategies that they developed to manage or survive after their mothers died were really, really helpful to them for a period of time, but have stopped working. They've lost their utility and they don't know how to let go of them or what to replace them with. That's a big reason why women come. They just say, I'm feeling stuck. And they often think that they're stuck in their grief. It's not usually that. It's that they are stuck in their coping strategies. Can I just break in and ask about what those are oftentimes? Can you list out a few coping strategies? Um, one may be a very strong commitment to independence, to not asking for help, from believing that you have to do everything yourself and take care of yourself. And that may have worked for a certain period of time, but when they wind up in a workplace, for example, or in a partnership or a romantic relationship, it can get in the way. Or they may be avoidant of, they may want a relationship, but they don't, they're afraid of getting close to anybody because of the fear of loss. So they have a pattern maybe of being avoidant in their emotional relationships. Um, they may be coming because they're afraid of going to a doctor and getting a diagnosis. And so they've been avoidant with their health and they're starting to realize that might catch up with them soon and they don't know what to do or how to get out of that. So those are just a couple of examples. But another reason that they come is because they are on the brink of a major life transition. And that is a time when grief tends to reactivate. And this is related to Brinda's story as well, because one of those moments is when you're about to become a mother. But what we see are women coming because they're about to get married. Maybe they come when they're engaged. Um, they are either about to become a mother or they've just become a mother. And they've made that transition and they have all these feelings coming up and they don't know what to do with them and they want to meet other women who can understand. Another big one, and we hear this a lot in every circle, there's always a couple of women who say, I'm here because I'm about to turn the age my mother was when she died. Or I am the age my mother was when she died or I just passed it. So that's a you know really important transition for them. We call it the silent threshold. Or they say, um, my child just turned the age I was when my mother died and I'm having a big grief reaction because they're realizing how young they were, how vulnerable, how much they still needed their mom, even though they may have told themselves they didn't, which is another coping strategy, which is, I don't need my mom. I'm old enough. I can manage without her. And to tell yourself that as a means of coping. And then when you watch your own child turn the age you were and you see how much that child may still depend on you, you cannot maintain that story, that narrative, that illusion anymore that you didn't need your mom. And so you find yourself grieving for the child that you were. And they come to the retreats often for that reason. So those are some of the common patterns that I see and some of the coping strategies. But certainly the transition to motherhood is that, the transition to motherhood for those who become parents and reaching the mother's age at time of death and passing it are the two most significant transitions that I see among this population and work with, in my, with my clients. One of the things I am curious about that you just mentioned is revisiting the story of your mom's death, but also the reframing. Right. And I, I want to just pull back a little bit because, of course, there's people listening who have not lost their mom or have not lost mm -hmm. a parent necessarily, but have lost someone. And of course, losing your parent is is a very significant loss. But I'm wondering, how is it that people of all circumstances and experiences who have had loss, that reframing. What are tools that people who have had loss can use or, or learn from what you're doing on these retreats? 
Well, my most recent book, The Aftergrief, which came out in the U.S. and the U.K. in hardcover and is coming out in paperback in the U.S. in, I think, March 1st, has all kinds of exercises in it that you can do yourself to revisit and reframe your story. And that's not a book just for motherless daughters. That's for any adult who has a loss in the past. And it doesn't have to be a mother either. It can be a father, a sibling, a good friend. But there are two exercises that we do at the retreats of many that I think are most helpful and easiest to describe. One is to reframe our narratives um, from victim to survivor. And to do that, we do some archetypal work. The women all have journals at the retreats and we have them write for a while. And every retreat is different because we tailor it to the needs of those specific women who are there. One exercise we occasionally do is write your story so that you are the victim of circumstance and everything happened to you where you had no agency at all and just let it rip. Just let it all out right from that place and don't hold back. And then they come back and they talk about writing that and how it felt. Sometimes it felt good. Sometimes it felt terrible. You know, everyone's story is different. And then we ask them to write for 15 minutes their story of loss in which they are the heroine and they have overcome every obstacle that was put in their way. And they are a true survivor and to be as self-congratulatory as they can and not hold back. And they do that for 15 minutes. And then we come back and talk about how that felt. And for some women, it felt really uncomfortable. And for others, it felt completely liberating and empowering. And then we talk about how your true story is somewhere in the middle. There's a path in the middle where you were at times a victim of circumstance and you were helpless and powerless, especially as a child. And there were times more often in your adult experience, but maybe your younger experience where you did have agency. And you were able to overcome enough obstacles to be here with us for these four days. And so that's a, one example of reframing and revising the story. Another exercise that we do or activity, it, we call it before and after. And when someone has lost a parent, they tend to look back at their history as fractured into two portions, before my loved one died and after my loved one died. And they will frequently attribute a different identity to themselves in those two portions. They have a fractured life story or a fractured life narrative. It's been cleaved at some point, whether they were six years old or 12 years old or 21 years old. And so we encourage them to make a list of all the one-word adjectives to describe who they believe they were or imagine they must have been before their mother died. This is much harder for a woman like Brenda, who was only two, because she doesn't know how she was. So she has to just Imagine what a one and a half year old would have been like with a mom. And they make a list of all the adjectives before. And then they make a line down the middle of the page. And on the left side, they do before. And on the right side, then we say, okay, now we'd like you to make a list of all the adjectives to describe you after your mother died. And some of them are the same, but most of them are different. And what we typically see is I was happy, I was secure, I was loved. And then afterwards, I was lost, I was confused, I was sad. But sometimes we see I was spoiled, I was bratty, I was difficult, and then I was independent, I was assertive. You know, so sometimes it moves into what we would call um, a redemption narrative versus the contamination narrative. A contamination narrative in social psychology is when your story goes from good to bad, and a redemption narrative is when it goes from bad to good. So they make the list on the page with the line down the middle, before and after. And then we ask them to turn the page and we say, now we want you to make a list of all the qualities under the heading, I am. And we want to know which qualities describe you on both sides of that line. Who were you throughout the entire process? What traits and characteristics were so deeply baked into your DNA that no trauma was going to take them away from you? Who did you come into the world to be and who do you believe you still are? And we often get a lot of blank stares. Like, what do you mean? I don't know how to do that. Because they've never thought about themselves in that way because they have become so invested in the story, this fractured life narrative of before my mom died and after my mom died. And we give them, you know, more tools for how to uncover this. And they say, oh, I was always a sensitive child. Oh, I was always really creative. Oh, I was always optimistic even when bad things happened. And they start to get a sense of, their uh, continuous self 
rather than the one that felt fractured. And that's another way of reframing a story. And some women say that is the most powerful exercise they do all weekend because they had never, or they had stopped or lost the ability to think of themselves that way. And then they can leave after the weekend and carry forth that knowledge into the world that mother loss is one of many things and maybe the most tragic thing that has happened to them in their lives, but that they have a continuous self that has existed all along and will to continue to exist moving forward and hasn't been broken or erased by this cataclysmic event. It sounds incredibly powerful. And I can imagine how being in a space where someone is guiding you through that process, and I suppose people could try doing that on their own, but I imagine kind of being shepherded through that is really a supportive experience for people. I think so. I think, you know, doing it in community, having a shared intention and having the support of others who are invested in your healing as well, which is what happens at these retreats. You know, the women really bond quickly, I, I think is essentially important. And like I said, you know, it's a, it's a utterly transformative experience. In such a short period, I was amazed the first time I saw it. You know, the very first day, I always have a co-facilitator. And on Friday, we do... um something we call story witnessing, where each woman has an opportunity to speak for anywhere, d depending on the size of the group, three to five minutes without interruption and just be listened to because so many women who lose their moms were not listened to when they were young. And they have an opportunity to speak continuously. And the prompt is, I've been waiting a long time to talk about. And they could talk about anything that they want. Some of them will talk about their mother's death for the first time. Some of them will talk about how much they hated their stepmothers, you know, or abuse that occurred in the family, or they will reveal secrets. Um, they feel that they're finally in a safe and non-judgmental place where they can speak from the heart. And it's very, very intense. You know, we do a few women at a time and then we take a break you know, just to pace it out. And if it's a new co-facilitator, because I work with different ones all the time, like to introduce new people to the work. Sometimes she'll come to me and say, oh my God, this is so intense. I had no idea. Like, oh my God. And I say, yeah, it is. But watch and wait. Because on Sunday afternoon when the women leave, there's so much lighter. And there's so much joy in this room. It's, this is why, I, because they'll say to me, how do you do this over and over and over again? I've done 14 retreats by now. And I say, I do it because I know where we're going to be on Sunday afternoon. And on Sunday afternoon, the co-facilitator will always come to me and say, oh my God, that was the most amazing experience. When can we do it again? So having that support and being in a community of women who understand, because if you've felt marginalized your whole life and then you have an opportunity to sit in a room, it's like any mutual help group, right? Like Alcoholics Anonymous or Overeaters Anonymous, everyone in the room shares a piece of your story. You're not alone. You've been listening to my interview with Hope Edelman. After a short break, we're going to hear Hope talk about how to support friends and loved ones who are mourning, the long arc of loss, and the reason why you never need to get over losing someone you love. We recently heard from two patrons of this show who left us these voice messages. Hi, this is Carrie from Brooklyn, New York. I became a patron of Full Moon Women because I'm excited to hear a multifaceted approach to women's multifaceted lives. Um, and I know it will not just be inspiring, but downright galvanizing. I myself am a choreographer and dancer and very invested in looking at women in the totality of their lives. Hi, my name is Scott. I live just outside of New York City, and I became a patron of Full Moon Women because I appreciate quality storytelling. I'm actually a longtime friend of Jamie's and also a fellow podcast producer myself, so I know a good story when I hear it. If you heard Jamie's previous podcast, Totem, you know she's really adept at weaving a compelling narrative and drawing listeners in, even when dealing with personal or potentially uncomfortable subject matter. So I'm looking forward to hearing more in-depth and thought-provoking conversations on future episodes of her show. Although I'm not a woman myself, I enjoy hearing about other people's experiences and perspectives, and I think this is a program that absolutely should exist in the world. And I hope you'll agree. 
If you believe in what we're doing here on Full Moon Women, I invite you to become a patron of the show. When you pledge a monthly contribution, you gain access to patron-only content. For example, this month, our guest Hope made an exclusive video just for the Patreon community of her doing a reading from her new book, The Aftergrief. Just find the link for Patreon in the show notes and choose from one of the five levels of giving. Thanks so much for your support. Now back to my interview with Hope. It sounds to me, and you tell me if I'm wrong, that the most helpful thing we can do for someone is to just see them and give space to let them talk and and share where they are. Or would you beg to differ? No, no, no. I would agree with you completely. I I really believe in the work of Alan Wolfelt and his work in companioning in grief and helping people learn how to be compassionate companions to those who are in mourning. It's Though our impulse may be to say to a friend who we care about or a relative, how are you doing? It's not the easiest question for a mourner to answer. You know, I I have said at times, you know, when I'm going through grief, um, I can tell you how I'm doing right now, but ask me again in an hour, the answer might be different. Because especially at the beginning, we ride that roller coaster. And sometimes we're up and sometimes we're down and how we're doing now may not be how we're doing tomorrow. But I find it enormously helpful when I receive this and, and also to give it to Warner to say, you've been on my mind. I've been thinking about you and I really care about you. And I want you to know that if you ever want to talk, I'm here. And then you just keep checking in. I have a friend right now who lost, just lost her dad. And so I'm just checking in and saying, hey, I'm thinking about you. Love you. I'm here if you'd like to talk or because that requires them to reach out. I'm going to call you tomorrow, you know, just to check in. And then if she feels like talking, I'm offering a space where we can do that. And if she doesn't want to, we can talk about something else or she doesn't have to answer the phone. But it's important, I think, and helpful for mourners just to know that there are people out there who care and will offer them that space. And not just right after the loss either. You know, I put in my, I'm going to put in my calendar that her dad died this month. So when this time of year comes around, you know, next year, I can check in and say, hey, I know it's, you know, been a full year now since you lost your dad and some stuff might be coming up, I'm here, I'm here if you'd like to talk. Also, it's really helpful with mourners, although it seems counterintuitive, to encourage them to tell stories of their loved one who died because it helps them feel better and it helps them process the loss and integrate it. Um, as we're listening to you share this, I'm trying to picture a scene, a typical scene where we might see a friend and how we would go about prompting them to tell a story in a way that doesn't feel, doesn't have artifice, you know, it feels genuine. So I see a friend in the grocery store, or I see a friend because we go out to get a coffee, or, you know, I see a friend at a party, like, can you walk us through something like that so that we can all be better at helping our friends? Well, I'm not sure this is the kind of conversation you want to have in the, the baked goods aisle. In a grocery store. <laughs> but you might say, you might say, hey, I've been thinking about you. Can I give you a ring? You know, and then have the conversation. But at a party or, yeah. you know, if you're out for lunch, um, a way to do it is to just say, um, hey, how are you doing with the loss? How are you feeling about it? You know, or are you missing your dad a lot? Or around Mother's Day, I know this is your first Mother's Day without your mom. And let them guide the conversation. If they don't want to talk about it, they'll let you know. But if they do, or if they're saying, yeah, I'm really missing her this time of year, what are you missing most about your mom? Oh, I miss, you know, that we always used to get together on Mother's Day and and go get our nails done. Oh, well, tell me, can you tell me a little about that? What, you know, where did you go? What kind of salon? What colors did you like? You know, you can tease the stories out of them and helps them feel better to remember good times with that person. We often think, oh, we don't, we shouldn't encourage those conversations because it'll just make them feel sad or it'll make them feel bad. But actually, All of the research in the bereavement world says the opposite happens, that people feel better when they can share stories, happy stories or funny stories about a loved one. I mean, Catholics know to do this at their wakes. They sit around and they share funny stories about the person who just died because it helps everyone feel better. And it reminds them that this is not just a person who died. This is also a person who lived. And we want to honor and remember that as well. Yeah, one of the things that I feel comfortable doing is when someone shares with me that their spouse or their mom or their father died or their cousin is, um, I just say, what was her name? And I often find that that is almost enough to kind of prompt if someone wants to talk, you know, 
the person will say, my mom's name was Janet. And of course, if this person is feeling a lot of feelings, usually stories will come up after that and to just, yeah, be there. Well, at the retreats, we have a, a moment, and this is really relevant to Brenda's story as well, because Brenda talked about how she doesn't have any of her mother's possessions. She doesn't really know who her mother was, and she doesn't feel particularly connected to her, but wants to. And I do retreats for women who lost mothers when they were young, meaning up to age 21, and women who lost mothers during adulthood, which could include anywhere up to a year before the retreat. And what I found is that the women who lost mothers when they were young are looking for ways to reconnect with their mom or connect with her for the first time if they were very young, because that connection has been broken. Because a child cannot hold that relationship and maintain that relationship themselves. They need help from the adults around them. And often the adults around them won't talk with them about their mom after a certain period of time. There's like an erasure in the family. Brenda talked about that, about how how um, Titra was erased from the family. And she was told when her stepmother entered, here's your new mom. And so if she were out of retreat, we would work with her on reconnecting with her mom in various ways based on information she knows or interviews she can do or in the imaginal world. The women who come to the retreat as adults are often looking for ways to stay connected to their moms. Um, you know, one of the things I want to talk a bit about your new book, After Grief, um, and I really love the subtitle, which is Finding Your Way Along the Long Arc of Loss. I'm wondering from all the research that you've done, what you know about why people feel that they have to get over the loss of a loved one. Um, and if we don't have to get over it, what do we do instead along this long arc of loss? Very good question. This belief or uh, misconception that we need to get over a loss is very much a 20th century invention or construct. There were a series of events that occurred in the first half of the 20th century, including two horrific world wars that led people to believe that grief was linear and progressive. And that means that there's an end point. We also were just marinated in, in modernism and capitalism and the ideas of efficiency and progress and getting people back into the workplace for productivity very quickly. And all of this, it was a confluence of events in the culture. And the sort of the high point of that being Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's book on death and dying that introduced the culture to the five stages of grief. Now, Kubler-Ross herself has been on record many, many times saying these five stages of grief were developed from the interviews I did with the terminally ill. These were people who were grieving the end of their own lives. They were experiencing phases of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. But somewhere along the way, those stages got transformed or moved over onto the bereaved, those who were left behind. And they became the five stages of grief. And they were always an ill-fitting model. But they were picked up by the media. They were picked up by popular culture because it was this idea like, oh my God, this enormous, incredible pain that I'm feeling that seems like it will never end. is actually a series of stages. And the fifth one is acceptance. And I'll be through it and I'll be over it and I will have put it down. And I will have, quote, moved on. We do move on, but we move on with the memory of the loved one. And instead now, the relational model of grief, which started developing in the 1990s, which is not really that long ago in the grand scheme of things, is about how we can find ways to carry our loved one forward and create new inner relationships with them rather than finding ways to leave them behind. But it's been a slow moving ship, you know, to get that message out into the culture. So that's what the after grief is all about. And that's the long arc of grief is a constant process of adjustment and adaptation and self-compassion when grief bubbles up even after decades. You know, there are still times, my mom died 40 years ago. 40 years ago, that's a hell of a long time ago. And there are still moments where it will just, you know, poke me and I'll start crying because I realize I remember something that I hadn't thought of for a long time or I'm reminded anew that she didn't get to meet her grandchildren or I realize how different my life would have been had my mom lived and or I'm going through something where I feel like I really need maternal compassion. Now, if my mother were alive today, she'd be 83 years old. I'm not even sure she'd still be living. But the longing for that kind of unconditional love and affection never leaves us ever. So 
I still, you know, can be moved to tears about my mother and my father who died when I was 40, that they're not here. And that's completely normal along the long arc of grief. But the culture of the last century pathologized that, you know, said people were abnormal mourning or they were stuck in grief if they were still occasionally um, having these resurgences or having reactivated grief. Um, now we know there are many, many reasons why grief may be reactivated. Now, if 40 years later, you're still incapacitated by your grief and you can't function on a daily level, which would be highly unusual after 40 years. But if you're still in that space after four years or five years, that's when professional grief counseling is highly recommended. Because there is something called a grief-prone personality. Those are people who tend to be prone to anxiety and depression to begin with. And that's when professional help can be really, really successful. But the average mourner or griever, because grief looks so much like depression, is often diagnosed with depression or medicated when really what they need is the social support and the comfort of their friends and loved ones around them to help them. And most people can move through grief without professional help. But fortunately, I hope, are, are starting to depathologize grief and accept it as a normal phase or a normal part of life, really, because, you know, God willing, we're all going to lose someone at some point. We're all going to live long enough to lose somebody that we love, especially someone who's older than us. And it's not something that we should wish for, of course, or, or hope for, but it is something that, you know, would behoove us to plan for and and offer ourselves the same kindness and compassion in our own grief that we would want to offer others. So I wanted to ask you about something that I that was on my own mind and I think could be on a lot of people's minds about losing someone and about the after grief, which is that not all of us daughters had moms or have moms that we like <laughs> or even love. Maybe we have lost our mom, not because she's died, but because of other reasons, um, estrangement or your mom left you for one reason or another, literally, physically, or on an emotional level. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Yes. Well, there are many ways to be motherless. And one of them is by death. And that's typically the area in which I work, early mother loss to death. But I have met many women who um, have lost their mothers to addiction, incarceration, abandonment, mental illness, or who have chosen at some point in their own lives to cut off the, the relationship with their mother, to become willfully estranged because they realize it's a toxic relationship or it's damaging to them and they can't continue in it and maintain their own serenity or sanity or sobriety, depending on the story. And so, yes, there are many ways to be motherless. And we are, in fact, talking right now, my team and I at, at in the motherless daughters field, about how to create some services for those women because we do hear from them. And they, in some ways, over the long arc, have a lot in common with the women who lost mothers to death because there is an absence of that maternal figure in their life when they're reaching milestones. But it's different if your mother is still physically alive because then there's always the hope that somehow that relationship can be mended. I do work with women who had relationships with their moms that were estranged and then the mother died before they could mend it. And that's another category. I've been criticized at times for writing a book in which so many women talk about having had good relationships with their moms. And I may have been unconsciously biased toward that because I had a good mom. I was lucky. It was a complicated relationship, especially when I was a teenager, complicated even further by her illness. But I think I had a pretty good mom. But I also acknowledge that not everybody does. And whenever I speak or write about it, I do offer an attention to that, to those who did not have a good mom or a mom who was there or capable or available or willing to mother them the way that we want to believe or hope a mother would. That mother myth that you talked about in Brenda's interview is pervasive in the culture. And so those of us who have living mothers who don't live up to the mother myth have an additional form of loss. Um, you've worked with so many women and talked to so many women and interviewed so many women on this theme and you experienced it yourself. And I'm wondering kind of what sticks with you of something that you have learned from the other women mm -hmm. that had you not told your own story and gained from that, if it had just, you know, been your own experience, what you've learned from other people. 
Whew. Can I give you two answers to that question? Yes. The first is, is simple. It's that I've learned that it is never too late to heal from early ones. Women come to the retreat in their 70s, even their early 80s, and maybe they've never talked about losing their mother before. And we see incredible things happen over the weekend and just watch, you know, their whole countenance change and their bodies become lighter. And them saying, you know, this is life changing for me. This weight that I've been carrying all these years, I feel like it's finally starting to lift. And that's beautiful to see and to know that it is never too late to do that work for oneself or give yourself that gift. The other is, I think, acknowledging that two truths can be held side by side, that I can, for the rest of my life, you know, at moments feel really sad that my mom died so young and so tragically and wish that she were still here and also acknowledge that as a result of her death, good things have happened in my life. And that doesn't mean that I'm glad that she died. Of course I'm not. It doesn't mean that I would, you know, trade those things to have her back either. I mean, I find that to be a, a you know, unproductive line of thought because I'm not being given that choice, you know, I, so I don't have to make it. My daughters exist because my mother died when I was 17. There's a very clear pathway from my mother's death when I was 17 to me not being able to find a book on that subject, to me becoming a writer and deciding to write that book, to publishing that book, which then formed a nonprofit in New York around that book that I was leading. And I rented office space from two men who were subleasing a part of their office for my nonprofit. And I got to know one of them. And we started dating and we got married and we had two children. Would I ever have met him if my mother had not died? Would my children exist in the world who are the absolute lights of my life? My two daughters, they're 24 and almost 20 now. I don't think so. So it's okay to acknowledge that some really good things can come out of tragedy. And that's a form of post-traumatic growth to be able to create those narratives and hold them side by side with your narratives of tragedy. They're, they're parallel stories and they're equally true. And I'm not sure I would have come to that understanding or realization had I not taken this on as a profession and listened to so many other women tell similar stories and be able to hold those stories side by side without guilt and without regret. Um, this leads to my last question. You bring up your daughters and I saw on your Instagram recently that you and your two daughters got the same tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> and lots of people saw that apparently. I'm kind of famous for the mother-daughter tattoo. Yeah. And I would imagine that having lost your mom when you were 17 and now being a mom, um, it, in this particular circumstance and constellation of things, um, I'm just wondering if, I don't know if you could say more about that, you know, getting the tattoos is in any way kind of symbolic of that. That's a really good question. You know, we got the tattoos because the family house of 24 years, which is the only house either of them have ever lived in, is being sold now. They've both moved out and my husband and I separated two years ago and it's time to sell the house. And so we wanted to do something to sort of mark the occasion of transition in our family but also do it in a way that reaffirmed the bond we have with each other. So we spent a lot of time thinking about what tattoo to get and then a little bit of time thinking about where to put it. And because our house was at the very top of a range in the Santa Monica Mountains, a very distinctive part of that range that you can see from the distance, my younger daughter had the idea of us getting the silhouette of that mountain range tattooed on us. And my older daughter found a, a photograph on online and created the design. And so we all went together and had them done and put on our shoulders. And I feel like it just affirms the history that we share and the love that we share. Because so many things are changing in our family right now and in our individual lives, you know, our professional lives, each of them. My younger daughter's in college now. And we felt like we wanted something that just said, you know, for these 24 years that we had this house together and lived there, we're going to carry that forward, even though we're letting go of the physical structure. And in terms of being a motherless mother, I think for me, that was particularly meaningful because I don't know if my daughters will have my possessions later in life. They might, but they'll always be marked by this memory 
and this experience. And we'll all have this tattoo. I mean, this isn't something I could have done with my mother. When I was a kid, the only people who had tattoos were Marines and Holocaust survivors, really. And my mother would have been horrified by the idea of me getting a tattoo. But it's my third tattoo. It's my younger daughter's first. It's my older daughter's maybe fourth or fifth. So it didn't seem like such a a big event for in and of itself. But I feel like, you know, it, it's a way of us saying, you know, we're part of each other forever. We're marking that indelibly with this ink. And in a year when so many other things are becoming impermanent, we are creating or reaffirming this permanent bond between us. I'm just talking out loud here. I'll probably write about this one day because I think it was even more profound than the, the funny photo that I put on Instagram of the three of us in a row with our matching tattoos. But I do feel that it may have been in some ways more powerful and meaningful for me as a mother without a mother to be able to do this with two daughters of my own. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Full Moon Women with the compassionate and an insightful Hope Edelman. If you haven't subscribed to the show, please subscribe and follow wherever you get your podcasts. If you are moved by this story, we invite you to leave Hope a voice message. We would love to hear from you and so would Hope. Just go to the show notes and look for the link that says voice memo. And we may just include your message in an upcoming episode. You might have noticed that this show is totally ad free and we want to keep it that way. The way we keep it ad free is through small monthly donations from our community of listeners. That's you. If you find that this show enriches your life, even in a small way, we would be so grateful for your support. To join the community and make a pledge, click the Patreon link in the show notes. As we shared earlier, current patrons of the show can access an exclusive video of Hope reading an excerpt from her new book, The After Grief. That's live right now on Patreon. So if you've already supported the show, you can just go to Patreon and check it out. And if you'd like to become a supporter of Full Moon Women, which starts at $3 a month, you can unlock that post and watch Hope read from her sunny home in California. This episode was produced by Pete Herkmans and myself. It was edited by Pete. I'm Jamie Younger, and you have been listening to Full Moon Women. Oh, hey, everybody. Actually, uh, P.S. We got this voice memo from Becky out in Nevada in response to Brenda's story, which is episode one, and we wanted to share it with you. Here it is. Hey, Brenda, I've got to tell you, listening to your story was so moving and so touching. And what it sparked in me is the fact that I want to start writing letters to my own kids. I have two little ones. They're three and 10 months old. And I was just so moved. And um, the part where you talked about, I wish my mom would have just written me a letter so that you could know about her and who she is as a person and how she felt about you at two um, and how meaningful that would have been to you really sparked for me that I want to do that for my own kids. So thank you so much for sharing your story. and for giving me the little push that I needed to go get some notebooks or notepads or pieces of random paper and start gathering some little thoughts and notes for my own kids. So if anything in any of the episodes of Fullman Women spark something in you, we invite you at any point to leave a voice message for the guests on this show, Brenda, Hope, or any of the upcoming episodes. And that's it. Until next time.